Uh, yeah, we're going to come to Revelation 17. Uh, preachers always need to come in prayer before we uh, seek to expound the word, but particularly this chapter. Um, let's pray. Lord, we do want to come and ask for your help as we consider this passage together. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would give us insight from your word. But also, Lord, uh, have the humility to say where we don't know, Lord, not try to boldly proclaim things that we cannot know, uh, but also, Lord, to re- search the scriptures. And Lord, uh, remind ourselves that you've spoken throughout your word on some of these matters. And Lord, we uh, pray as we do so, Lord, we would be encouraged and uh, be content with what we can know. Mm. And Lord, to be warned and prepared so that when we see these things taking place, we will know and be aware and assured of what is taking place. And not only that, take comfort from the fact you saw it all beforehand and that you told us in advance. We give you praise. Amen. Amen. Okay, so uh, we're going to take as a kind of led discussion format. Um, As we read this uh, through this chapter, I'm going to stop every so often and pose some questions. But then we'll see, come to more, look at more of those answers at the end because we'll kind of work our way backwards, as it were, because the answers are at the back at the end of the chapter and the questions are at the front. So it makes more sense to consider it more when we've read, gone through it. So, But Revelation 17 and verse 1. Then one of the angel, seven angels who had seven bowls came and spoke with me saying, come here and I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters with whom the kings of the earth committed acts of immorality and those who dwell on the earth were made drunk with the wine of their immorality. So just uh, some questions have kind of struck me as we were as I read them through and considering that passage, the question is like, who is the harlot? Why is she being judged? What does it mean for the kings of the earth to commit acts of immorality with her? Obviously, these are metaphors and pictures that were uh, trying to tell us something. Okay, and then verse 3. Uh, Carry me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, full of blasphemous names, having seven heads and ten horns. <clears throat> and so again the question is, who is who is this beast? And what does it mean, or what does it mean for her to be sitting on the beast, or riding the beast, as it can be considered? And then verse, reading from verse 4. The woman's, woman was clothed in purple and scarlet. This is a bad choice of top, wasn't it? Uh, and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. Having a hand in her hand, a gold cup full of abominations. And of unclean things of her immorality. And on her forehead a name was written. A mystery. Babylon the Great. The mother of harlots. And of abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints. And with the blood of the witnesses of Jesus. And when I saw her I wondered greatly. And the angel said to me. Why do you wonder? I will tell you a mystery. Of the woman and of the beast that carries her. Which has seven heads and ten horns. So then. Questions came. uh, Things like. Is there any significance as to how she's dressed? What's the meaning of the name on her forehead? Drunk with the blood, what does that mean? Uh, Is it a mystery? And then, from verse 8, The beast that you saw was, and is not, and is about to come up out of the abyss, to, and go to destruction. And those who dwell on the earth, whose name have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, will wonder when they see the beast. And what 
what, what he was and is not and will come. And it is a mind which has wisdom. The seven heads of seven mountains on which the woman sits. And they are seven kings. Five are fallen. One is, the other is not yet come. And when he comes, he will remain a little while. The beast which was not and is not, sorry, the beast which was and is not, is himself also an eighth and one of the seven. And he goes to destruction. The ten horns which you saw were ten kings, which are not yet, or who have not yet received a kingdom, but they receive authority as kings with the beast for one hour. And they have one purpose, and they give their power and their authority to the beast. Okay, so at this point, we've been given some information. Not just the pictures, but the explanation of some of the pictures. So we'll, we'll start here, really, and start considering what, what's being said. First thing that's said is that this beast was and is not and is about to come up out of the abyss. So we're considering who is this beast? Um, well, we've seen it before, haven't we? Yes. Are we going back to the scarlet beast in three? Is that, in, presumably that's the same one? In what, where, sorry? Um, verse three. Oh yeah, but before, um, yeah, but it's, before that, even before that, verse three. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it is, it is the same yeah, beast, yeah. Some people refer to it as Europa. Chapter 12. Well, there's an interesting idea behind Europa. And so, um, yeah, let's take that now then. Okay. Um, so you say Europa. Why do you say that? Do you know why you say that? Europa is riding a beast. Mm. And um, there's a statue outside the European headquarters of a woman riding a bull or a beast. Yeah. And she's referred to as Europa. Isn't she? Yeah. It's... Um, it's actually from mythology, so it, it was a story in the existence, and, and she's also referred to as the goddess of prostitutes as well. Isn't she? I think so. Yeah. I think you're right. You might be right, yeah. but it might know better more than me. I don't specifically remember that. What I remember of the story was that actually the beast then rapes Europa in the story, yeah. mm -hmm. um, and it's it's really. I don't know about interesting. It's strange that Europe would take this image. Mm -hmm. uh, make mention of it in the, the booklet on Europe is that out of all the images that you might use on your coin and talk about, why would you take this image mm -hmm. given the story, given the, what happens in the story? You know, that, that just is a really mm -hmm. surreal idea that you would and almost celebrate and, and yes the statues it's an image that's used on the euro um, and the building itself um, yeah. the modelled after the Tower of Babylon yeah so the tower yeah the bugle's uh, picture of the Tower of Babel yeah. um, so we've got all these kind of images and so obviously the, we kind of read this and we go oh okay that's interesting and so I think we do have to go, oh, okay, that's interesting. I think there's value in that. And we'll consider that a bit in a moment. But just sticking with uh, the word and what the word says. And what I want to try and do is focus on what the word of God says about these things first. And then before we kind of try and pluck from our current situations or the things we see around us for relevance. Because it's important that we let the word of God lead us to in our understanding before we let the situation around us because one of the things I think that's the problem we've, we have in the whole of the book of Revelation is that people have dogmatically stated things related to the times around us so the, you know the Pope was the Antichrist and the Roman Catholic Church is uh, and all these sorts of things and we're going to consider that as we 
go through this. And that, but the danger is that we kind of just take what's relevant to us at the time uh, and say, oh, well, this must be it because this is what is at the forefront of our issue. And then, of course, if you were in communist Russia, you might see that as the kind of the, the, the beast. And, and, and depending where you are, and of course, the early church would have probably seen the Roman Empire as the beast at the time, to some degree. They will kind of address that as we go. So, yeah, it's, it's important. We're going to try and consider some of the where we are at the moment as we get on towards the end. But uh, just for now, let's because uh, we're considering what this beast is. What else in the, the in the Word of God do we see these beasts? 12, uh, chapter twelve, verse three. Chapter twelve, verse three, or um, okay. I was going to 13. A great fiery red dragon having, um, okay. who, who was Satan. Yeah. Um, so I think that's not the same. Um, I don't think that's the same. It's not the same. Beast. No. I think we're talking about some, obviously that's, well, so obviously. <coughs> the dragon, I think it's Satan, um, because it actually it describes him as Satan. <laughs> Um, and actually, if we go to Revelation 13, you'll see the dragon there. Let's look at Revelation 13. As there it says, And the dragon stood on the sand of the seashore. Then I saw a beast coming out of the sea, or the abyss, as it's uh, translated later, or considered later. And this one has ten horns and seven heads. And so it's this beast, I believe, that yeah. is being referred to here in chapter 17 because it's the same description, the ten horns yeah. and seven heads. Oh, ten horns. Well, the, in 12, it's the same. Ten. In 12, I think it's the... Is it ten. the other way around? No. no seven. Seven, oh, seven heads and ten horns. Yeah. yeah. It's the, it is the dragon there. And it describes it as Satan. Where the beast and the dragon um, uh, gave his power in chapter 13 and authority. So um, it's obviously something that is different. different. The first one is clearly Satan in 12. Um, because it, it refers to him as the dragon. And here it's the beast. But uh, the dragon gives its power to the beast. Which is what we find in 18 as well really. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, um, yeah, we see that the kind of the dragon and the, you see swept away a third of the stars of heaven. So he, here we kind of see the, the dragon is Satan in Revelation 12 and how it's the described. And, and the beast isn't Satan. One the beast is, well, the beast is kind of, and we'll consider a bit, bit more as we're going on, who is the beast. And So there's two... But there's, not, there's two beasts as well, just to make it more interesting. There's two beasts in Revelation 30. Uh, when we're going through it, there's a beast that comes out of the abyss or out of the sea. And then there's another beast uh, that comes up out of the earth. That has two horns um, like a lamb and spoke as a dragon. Mm. Exercises the same authority as a beast. And uh, if we remember... Um, you can go back and listen to the messages it was a while ago though in Revelation 13 this second beast we eventually got to the conclusion that this is the false wit the false prophet described later in Revelation so we've got the false prophet and then the beast uh, what's the other name for the beast in Revelation how is he described in other places or how might we consider him to be if we know that, that we know there's a fig, there's figures at the end times, okay? So we've got we know the Satan, the dragon. We know there's the false prophet, the Antichrist, the, Antichrist, uh, the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist, the beast, all the same image, uh, um, person. But so we're kind of with that idea of this this person, the Antichrist. But also we see something else, don't we, about this? idea <coughs> because it says more than just as if he's a person um, let me just re go back reading through what I've put here though so we've got this beast we've seen before in Revelation 13 there's two beasts the second is the false prophet 
but this is the first first beast, and he has the same description. Um, then I saw the the beast coming out of the sea, having ten horns and seven heads, and on the horns were ten diadems. Uh, actually, the other one had seven diadems, I think, uh, when it refers yeah. to the dragon. Yeah. And here's something different. Yeah. Um, and we see here that there are ten kings mm-hmm. on the ten horns, uh, or seven horns. Oh, it gets confusing with the sevens and the tens. Mm-hmm. But yeah, stay, <laughs> stay with it. Um, I think we might say, too, that with chapter 12, but, uh, yeah, okay, so it has seven heads and ten horns. And when you come to chapter 13, that in a sense, the power of this beast has, is derived from Satan. Yeah. Um, so that's, uh, I think, would tie up the, why the, the, the same sort of description is there about seven heads and ten horns. Yeah, yeah it's deliberately dis- similar descriptions, isn't it, to indicate that they're of the same kind. Yeah. Same power. Yeah, same power, yeah, demonic power. Okay. Is there anywhere else where we see this sort of description that's similar to this beastie? Daniel somewhere, is it? Daniel, yeah. Daniel 7, I think. Should we go to Daniel 7? The problem is I didn't make a note of the verse. Or verses... Twenty-three. Yeah, well you get twenty-four. You get it twice, don't you? you get yeah. these uh, before and after kind of. Yeah, verse twenty. Yeah, um, you get this for um, nineteen. You want to read from nineteen? Go on, you read it. I'll save my voice. Then I desire to know the exact meaning of the fourth beast, which was different from all the others. Exceedingly dreadful, with its teeth of iron and its claws of bronze, and which it devoured, crushed, and trampled down the remainder with its feet. And the meaning of the ten horns were, uh, that were on its head, and the other horn which came up, and before which three of them fell, namely that horn which had eyes and a mouth, uttering great boasts, and which was larger in appearance than its uh, associates. I kept looking, and that horn was waging war with the saints and overpowering them. Until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was passed in favour of the saints of the Highest One. And the time arrived when the saints took possession of the kingdom. Thus he said, the fourth beast will be a fourth kingdom on the earth, which will be different from all the other kingdoms, and will devour the whole earth and tread it down and crush it. As for the ten horns, out of this kingdom ten kings will arise, and another will arise after them. And he will be different from the previous ones and will subdue three kings. And he will speak out against the Most High and wear down the saints of the Highest One. And he will intend to make alterations in times and in law. And they will be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. And it goes on to say that he will be judged and his kingdom will be taken away. It really even starts him back in verse 7. Yeah, you see it earlier. The fourth beast. So, you can see how that, again, there's, there's a description there that's the same. This is important we, um, when we look through these passages that we don't just pluck it out from thin air and uh, just say, oh, well, here's an idea. Um, it's more important what the scripture says about these passages and how they tie up together than what we might think or how we might apply it to our day. But we'll uh, we'll get we'll just park that for a bit. So we've got the ten horns and seven heads. Uh, the ten horns have ten diadems. Let's skip on to the next thing uh, before we get into that. It says those whose names are not in the Lamb's Book of Life um, will wonder, or it could be a marvel, or will be have admiration of. It's that kind of idea when it's not just a wonder of being puzzled by. It's a uh, are looking with awe and uh, are marvelling and have admiration of. Those who aren't of the Lord, aren't the Lord's, will be in awe of it. Are you uh, right now in chapter 17? Yeah, sorry. Verse Back to Reve- Revelation chapter sorry, 17. Talking about verse 8, not verse 3. You were saying, was it the verse 3, weren't you? Earlier. Yes. Yeah, it was verse 8 he was referred to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
Uh, so we've considered before there are uh, these two aspects to the beast. Uh, it's a, a system as well as a person. We consider that, that these are kingdoms or a kingdom as well as a person. And we get that from some of the other things that I said. So we'll try and, as we go through, see that. So when we talk about the mark or the image of the beast, it could either be the image of the leader, the Antichrist, or it could be the mark or image of the system. As I've tried to um, consider, um, and they worship the image uh, or more, uh, they worship the image of the system or the leader, mm-hmm. the Antichrist. So, because we've considered that before, these kind of questions around, oh, the mark of the beast is this, or is going to be like that, and it might be barcodes and things like that. Well, the Bible clearly says that the, the, the image and the mark is related to the system. Uh, and so, it will be obvious to those who are believers. The unbelievers will be in awe of these people, but the believers will recognize it. They will see it. And that's kind of the the point. Um, sometimes uh, people make out like it's some secret, you need this secret hidden knowledge that they're going to expound to you. And it, it's actually quite a dangerous thing. It's a bit cult-like to When these people make bold claims about that this is what the image is going to be or this is this is what the mark of the beast is going to be or this is and that they've got some hidden kind of revelation that's quite dangerous because the word tells us what the word tells us and we shouldn't go beyond that Um, and when we do we're actually in really dangerous dangerous for ourselves but dangerous for other people um so we just need to consider um that carefully and watch out for that that danger that we can follow someone else's interpretation and it actually happens a lot with other things in scripture we get kind of bogged down in man's interpretation rather than what the bible says you see with some other things maybe the uh i could point put put my finger on a few other things that well we see with calvinism for one that people get locked in this system of man's teaching that's the Bible is more complex. It's not as black and white as we like. Sometimes we like to make it easy for ourselves. And Galvanism is a quite a thick system. Um, and there's lots of truth in it. But the problem is it kind of boxes you in. And the Word of God actually goes, has more spectrum to it than this little black and white box that we've painted for ourselves. Um and it's the same with some other things. And, and if the danger is once we get locked into ideas that are fixed, but they're the ideas of man rather than the scriptures, then, we, then we'll miss it. We won't see it. And we can't see past our ideas. And I think sometimes that's what's happened with, you know, people are getting very concerned about microchips. Yeah. And the Bible doesn't say anything about microchips. Mm. Now, well, to be aware of it, because we know something about the mark of the beast. But there's nothing in microchips that is telling us this is the mark of the beast. There's nothing that we need to be concerned about in barcodes that was telling us that this was the mark of the beast. But yet people were going uh, after these things uh, and saying these things are, oh, this could be it. Well, what does scripture tell us? And we just need to make sure we're obedient to scripture and, and concerned about when we see it, we'll know it. And we don't actually need to get so in fear almost. And I think there is a danger with some of these ideas that we get in fear. Anyway, so uh, what do we see here in these passages? What else do we see? Seven heads, seven mountains, which the woman sits on. What else does a woman sit on? The beast. <coughs> the beast? Yeah. What else does a woman sit on? We haven't actually got there yet in this chapter, but we're about to read it. The waters. The waters. <coughs> so sometimes uh, we get, again, this is kind of a danger if we get fixed on this idea, and a lot make this thing of the seven, seven mountains. 
um, the, the, the woman sits on and then they kind of say, well, Rome actually has seven mountains. Uh, we considered, I think, last time that Jerusalem has seven mountains, actually, on the city of Jerusalem. It's made up of seven mountains. Some say Babylon uh, was built on seven hills as well. Yeah. So. Um, but, and so we kind of, again, some people have got very fixed on, oh, well, there you go, this, it's definitely Rome or it's definitely Babylon or it's definitely this. Well, Actually, she sits on seven mountains, and then it goes on to say, which are seven kings? Um, and we take this one kind of picture, and we kind of build a whole doctrine uh, and understanding on it, and we get very fixed and locked into that. And I don't think there's much information on which to base a whole idea about, uh, you know, what is going to be the kingdom of the beast, based on that little information that we have. Especially as it also says that she sits on waters which are, it says our peoples and multitudes and as we've said she also sits on the beast and uh, all these things are, are telling us something but not necessarily uh, I think the how, only thing that perhaps points a little bit to more to Europe is that the, the fourth beast that had ten horns in Daniel was very definitely Rome because there was a sequence that God revealed of uh, four kingdoms that were going to rise, Babylon um, Syria um, Persia, Greece and then Rome um, no, the other one. no it's, uh, it's Babylon isn't it Syria has already gone Babylon uh, Greece um, Beats and the Persian. Persians and then uh, and Rome yeah. mm -hmm. or is it the other way around it's the, no Greece is, isn't Greece first Greece Third. comes after Persia yeah well the last, well the, I mean there is that so I've heard contention about even that, that, that kind of interpretation of thingy, which I, certainly is how I've always understood it. But there's also this idea, at which point does the rock of Christ, because then the rock cr is Christ that crushes all these kingdoms. And so the question is, it, is that rock coming, crushing then, when Christ comes in his first coming, or is it coming in his second coming and crushing the kingdoms of the world? And there's kind of an element where there's... Again, when Christ first came, didn't it, in one sense, began to set up an eternal kingdom. That's certainly the, that's certainly the argument that kind of... And I'm generally the one I'm more comfortable with. But there is something in here that there kind of, I think, poses a bit of a question to that, and I'll, we'll get to it in a second. So, anyway, the, yeah, possibly Rome. Worth considering Rome. Worth considering Jerusalem. Worth considering Babylon. But it also says um, about seven kings, or I think historic kingdoms is probably a better way to understand it, because it talks about five have been, yeah, yeah. Um, and then, and so on. Um, I'm just trying to skip through. Yeah, I've said about how sometimes things are built on, uh, we hear people building end time things, ideas on, Small details. Um, <coughs> saying how God's chosen people had much more information about Jesus' first coming, yet they didn't understand yeah. what it would be like, um, what they were looking for. But those who had eyes to see it recognized it, even for a, if through a glass dimly. Uh, we'll see it when it's revealed. Okay, seven kings. Five have fallen. And it says, uh, uh, and it talks about this beast that was, is not, and is to come. Mm -hmm. And that was the one thing I, fa I feel about the Rome, is the question of, well, why is John considering it is not? Because Rome certainly was. Mm -hmm. It was certainly in existence and in power at that time. So, as he's saying, there comes a point at which it doesn't exist, and then it will be revived. Uh, yeah, well, so, so this is that, that's kind of the understanding. But I think that that's, that question is interest, an interesting question is to is not at that point in, in time it was, um, and I don't. This is why I'm, why I'm like, you know, it does us good not to be too firmly yeah. fixed on looking at Rome, but it also is worth noting. In Daniel's situation, it seems to very much more fit that. And we know as well from history that the Romans did make changes in law 
They made changes in times. They changed the calendar completely. Um, some would say, well, we completely removed kind of all the ideas of the Jewish feasts and all these things in Christian circles uh, or replaced uh, a lot of these things with Christian ideas, so-called Christian ideas. And that was kind of the Roman Empire that did that. So those are kind of valid, but we also kind of think, I think, again, what we see is are these cycles of prophecy. Mm-hmm. So it was true for the Roman Empire then, for Daniel, but it may be different, but similar. And those are images of what is going to happen in the future, just like the Antichrist taking his temp- seat in the Temple of God. Well, we saw that happen in the past. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um Twice, in fact, yeah. uh, before Jesus coming and after Jesus coming. Mm. Uh, Antiochus Epiphanes yeah. before, before, yeah. and then was it Nero who set up his um, mm. it, set up his uh, image in the temple um, before, uh, basically, as he was before it was destroyed. Um, so the image of Rome was there, and of course that, that also told us about you know when you see the armies coming up against Jerusalem, lift up your heads, because it was also a time when they needed to flee Jerusalem. And you see people who say, oh, we don't need to worry about all these end time things, that that all happened in AD 70 and all this sort of thing. Well, actually, the cycles. It was Caligula, actually. Caligula, Mm. okay. Um, And so we see cycles, and and sometimes it's a picture of what's going to happen in the future, and it might not be the same, but it it gives us an idea, at least, of what it's going to be like. Um, Anyway, so that's for us to consider. Um, So think in terms of kingdoms rather than kings. Yeah, Uh, yeah, because we know the kings can't come back, don't we? So it talks about the the one, there is one, isn't, uh, and then will be again. We know that kings can't come back to life, but we know the kingdoms sometimes come back to life. And we considered that, and we considered how Europe could be a revived Roman Empire, how the Treaty of Rome was signed in the ruins of the Roman Empire, and all these things that we've considered before. Excuse me, Dave, where are you reading from where you're saying that they were, were and one is not? Sorry, um, let me go back. Uh, is it verse A? Yeah. I've just got it in my notes. Well, there's two. There's one that is, uh, and, what, and then there's one to come. Oh, and then there's this interesting about question about what is the kingdom that's to come, and is that uh, the Islamic kingdom that they hadn't yet experienced that was to come, that was to remain for a little while, um, that would have been the seventh. Um, yeah, but it's interesting as well because there's this five kingdoms, and then there is. There's one, if, the, if there was one at the time, it would have been Rome. Mm-hmm. That would be the sixth. And then, so what if the fourth piece, uh, you know. So we've got, it's not exactly straightforward. And I think the, the point of, that we can, the Dave trap is falling into is saying, oh, well, it was this way. Mm-hmm. The other thing, of course, uh, when I was, uh, is that uh, Babylon is also significant because Daniel is a significant prophet in, the, in relation to this, and he was living in Babylon. Mm. And it could be the Babylonian Empire that revives itself, because it certainly was not at the point of when uh, the revelation is given to John. The, the Babylonian Empire was gone. Mm. So that was my one kind of thing, I think, that sometimes we can be, oh, well, it definitely is kind of the Roman Empire. Yeah, I can certainly see the argument for it, but there's also this question mark about Babylon. And because Babylon is so... Uh, specifically mentioned throughout. Historically, because we have an issue with Rome, and particularly the Roman Church, uh, as Protestants, we've kind of gone, oh, well, it's, you know, this is, this is the issue. This is what we see in front of us. This is causing us all the problems, and it was burning believers at the stake and all these ma- all manner of things. But, of course, yeah, there are other questions. Um, like the fact that Babylon's very specifically mentioned. And this idea, I think, when we were going through earlier about how where the kings come from. 
uh, that the kings come through Babylon, up that um, through that region. The fer- uh, what's that fertile crescent called? Or is it called well, the fertile crescent? Is, uh, yeah. Right, right. Actually, I've read a book, somebody sent me a book years ago when um, Saddam Hussein was in power, and they were very much showing what a you know an empire he was building really at that time. But of course, it's crashed down since. But uh, they really thought of uh, the author of this book thought. Uh, uh, talking literally has been uh, Babylon. He was re- rebuilding Babylon, wasn't he? Yeah. Um, Putting his own name <coughs> on, uh, on it, where Nebuchadnezzar's <coughs> name had been in bricks before. Yeah. But we still see uh, there's still spiritual powers at work in, in the, that area. We're seeing still with ISIS and all these things. And again, there's, there's something bubbling under the surface there that because it's not on our doorstep, we don't necessarily see it as as relevant as Europe, because Europe is on our doorstep and affecting us here in the UK. But actually what we need to be looking at more is Israel, because that's the the significant area, if you like. Uh, what is affecting Israel more than what is affecting us here in the UK? Or what is affecting the people in China? Or what is affecting the people in South America? It's what is Israel is the key, but of course Europe is fiercely anti-Israel as well, so... Okay. On the other hand, with Babylon, uh, we need to remember that uh, Babel in Hebrew is always the word that is for Babylon. And when you think of the Tower of Babel, as we call it, uh, Babel, the Tower of Babel, um, that's where they sought to build up to heaven. And so that was, as it were, uh, the beginning we'll of this religion. So the mother of harlots. Oh, we'll come into that. Could, sorry, yeah, jump in okay. Because we're talking about the feast at the moment, uh, um, yeah. and these are kingdoms. And then we're, so I think, but yeah, I think we're, we're pretty much getting on to that bit now. Um, yeah, history is important, particularly biblical history, when we consider the end times. It says that the beast is one of the seven kings, but is also an eighth. So again, we kind of, this is a idea of a future. We also get this idea um, later about it healed from its fatal wound. Yeah. Um, that's that idea of something that died out but recovered. Mm-hmm. So some of these ideas are used throughout scripture. And then we have this idea of ten horns that are ten leaders who have not yet received a kingdom that they'll get their authority from the beast. Mm-hmm. So that'll be an interesting time when we see it says they, for a short period, and maybe that's a great tribulation, the three and a half years. Um, but these are kind of not on the scene yet, and they may not be on the scene yet, even now. But at some point we'll see the Antichrist give authority to ten kings. And that should make us really sit up and notice. Uh, these are, in effect, puppets who lead people back to the beast um, anyway. Uh, yeah, and then we have this verse 14 uh, that's really just an encouragement uh, these will wage war against the, la- uh, the lamb and the lamb will overcome them because he is king of kings uh, the lord of lords and king of kings and those who are with him are called the called and the chosen and the faithful mm-hmm. victory is assured for the lamb mm-hmm. no matter how impossible um, we have these all the way through revelation we have these little interludes that say sort of say yes this is really bad but victory is assured for the lord jesus christ and his <laughs> followers and then last week uh as we the last section uh we get from verse 15 i'll read this but then he said to me the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are the peoples and the multitudes and the nations and the tongues and the ten horns which you saw and the beast, these will hate the harlot and will make her desolate and naked and will eat her flesh and burn her up with fire. For the Lord has put it in the hearts, in their hearts to execute his purpose by having a common purpose, by, and by giving the, um, by giving their kingdom to the beast until these words of God will be fulfilled. And the woman whom you saw is the great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. Okay, so we considered uh, where the harlot sits. 
That's a world, if you like. Um, it talks about nations and peoples and tongues. All the nations of the world. Uh, we considered the ten horns and the ten kings who have yet to receive their authority. But it says, so these ten kings and the beast will hate the harlot and make her desolate and basically destroy her. Now this is an interesting question, isn't it? Why will these kings, under the power of the beast, destroy the harlot? Why do they hate her? That's the question I was going to ask, because um, in Nahum, um, chapter 3, verse 4, it says she uh, who sells nations through her harlotries and families through her sorceries. And to me, it looks as if it's the woman that's bringing the nations and, and people, to, you know, under the control of the beast. So, so why, indeed, do, yeah. do they hate her? So, so what could it be that the harlot has that these future kings and the Antichrist might hate? Religion, perhaps, because they want to be a secular society. That was my, my view. Religion. Well, so, religion. So, religion. Religion. So, as it's being pointed out, the, the, the harlots... I mean, some people see it as a Roman Catholic church was kind of this idea. Um, but I actually think it represents more all false religions. For me, and this is very much a personal kind of, as I read it, this is how I feel, not. So please don't take this as a dogmatic, this is how it is. But as I read it, this is how it looks to me. Um, so really want to underline, this is my personal view, not not, oh, this is what the word of God says. But because we see in the world, don't we, today, that secular humanism hates religion. Mm. That even now, because um, finally we've seen that uh, Islam has been able to coexist for a long time on the left, um, and yet now, because Islam is saying, oh, we can't tolerate this LGBT stuff, what wins out? It's not Islam. In this case, it's the LGBT stuff. The secular humanist ideas of LGBT win out over Islam. The religion comes down the pecking order to secular humanism that says you can do whatever you want to make you happy and whatever you feel is right in your own eyes. And we know that communism yeah. and Marxism that hates religion, it has to destroy religion. And so it seems to me that this, the uh, the only sense thing that would make sense, and it seems it seems kind of as we were talking about how out of Babylon came all false religions of the world, and it talks about harlotry, and what is harlotry a picture of in the Bible all the way through is it's about how the children of Israel played the harlot with God, that they went after other gods, and so harlotry very much is tied up with mm. false religion, and so it make to me that's how. I think the harlot represents false religions. And so the kind of beast uses, uh, the woman kind of rides this kind of kingdom, secular humanism that makes it tolerant of all religions. We see that, don't we, today? This idea of that secular humanism initially says, well, we'll tolerate all religions, that everyone should tolerate Islam and things like this. And then at some point it gets to a point, oh, no, we can't tolerate this any longer. And we hate religion and we're going to destroy it. And of course it would be easier to go after the Christians if they lump all religions in together. Because otherwise they're accused of, well, you're just prejudiced against believers. It's easier to destroy all religions. And so that for me is the kind of way how I would see the beast hating all religions. And of course we see that in some, some nations already in China which kings from the east and millions of people army we consider the relevance of that kings of the north we see Russia communist nations these are just my kind of thoughts on these things and they shouldn't, certainly shouldn't be taken dogmatically 
Yeah. And we see, in a sense, Europe is becoming a secular humanist, even yeah. though it was, I was just initially. Point I was make, because originally, uh, Roman Catholicism had much more place in it. Uh, Twelve stars of the flag is the twelve uh, stars around uh, Mary's head in uh, in Strasbourg. Uh, so, um, and Master Treaty uh, went every day uh, to uh, to mass uh, before um, got his name now. Uh, Jack the Law. Yeah, Jack the Law. Uh, it was very prominent, but um, yeah. and Pope addressed uh, the um, uh, European Parliament, but less so as so Roman Catholicism seen there as much more secular. Now. And isn't that really actually in the story of Europe? But that's that it kind of the woman rides a beast, and then the beast turns on it. Mm-hmm. And in a sense, that's you know here, woman rides a beast, and it turns on it. Mm-hmm. Or false religions arrive in this secular humanism that allows all religions to kind of exist together and then bang now now we're going to destroy you all Um, so that's kind of my view on that how that could work because it doesn't but it's certainly a conundrum Um, and if you don't think that's the case that's that's fine it certainly leaves us with a conundrum though as to why why how these things should exist how the beast should come up and yet this thing that obviously kind of feels like it's also Satan's inspiration, the the false religion, this kind of harlot, that's obviously a bad thing. Um, and we know that, you know, it's not just Roman Catholicism that's killing believers, true believers. Of course, we're seeing it with Islam all the more, more so in this day and age. And one of the things I think as well, we kind of, when we're kind of very much focused on the Church of Rome because we're Protestants, I think we're missing the fact that Islam is also doing the things that we that we see in the Antichrist system, that the beheading, or, or sorry, in um, these things of the, what the, we see of the harlot, the um, beheading of believers particularly, is a kind of something that we see in Islam. Um, I actually think, yeah, we're, sometimes we're, we were probably a bit too. Being Paisley, particularly in people like that crowd, were just so so against the Catholics because they were who were nearby, mm. and that's the kind of thing I think our warning, particularly even with the Euros, our warning is well, this is nearby, and we'll see what happens. Yeah. Some of us were like, well, oh, no. you know, is the European Union falling apart in front of us? Well, actually, what we see a lot of time is these cycles of them, these things gathering momentum, crumbling and out of the ashes of the thing that's crumbled, something else even worse comes about. And actually, even with Saddam Hussein and and now, actually, we got rid of Saddam Hussein, but we then had ISIS in its place. And um, yes, Saddam Hussein was awful, but what followed wasn't any better. It's actually, I think, the the danger when we think we can change regimes unless we unless the Lord transforms a nation then it will carry on just being under the same spiritual powers anyway um, there are just a, as, um, so it talks about God's going to um, fulfill his purposes by bringing them together to do this and even God is going to destroy the, all these false religions at this point um, to bring about his end time purposes which is an interesting thing uh, and then it says, it finishes by the woman who sh- you saw is a great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. And we'll see next time that it kind of deals with Babylon. The next chapter is dealing with Babylon the Great and it talks about a city. And so that really does create as a problem because we've got to decide on a city at some point or figure out what the city is. And that's where we kind of get ourselves... Uh, really stuck um, but there's some cities we can consider that are possibilities and there might be a city that's yet to exist but we'll save that for next time because it's more about the next time and you can read it in advance we'll be looking at it next Sunday anyway because uh, Ashley will still be on paternity leave and I'm speaking again tomorrow uh, next Sunday night so got a week to look forward to it <laughs> and find out all the answers Let's pray. Lord, we do want to thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for the passages that speak clearly to us and 
we can stand upon as uh, enduring until the end and, and true and reliable and those things that are a mystery to us at this point that will be revealed in the future. Lord, we thank you that the encouragement we can take, Lord, that you have seen all these things, that they have already taken place in your mind and that you know the end from the beginning. And Lord, we thank you that you have declared truth that the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdom of our Lord and this Christ and that there will be victory for the Lamb. Lord, we thank you for these things. Help us to keep our eyes fixed on these hopes and assurances in the face of perplexity of what's going on in the nations. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.